right, so um, this is the digestive system, and I know it looks a little bit weird. Most of the other stuff in the body has disappeared, except for um, the pieces of this story that are actually relevant to us. Um, so here we can see the brain. So this is the brain stem. These in green here are the salivary glands, the oral cavity and esophagus, the stomach, pyloric sphincter. I have exaggerated the duodenum because we know that the duodenum has a lot of different stuff happening in it. Um, lots of control mechanisms, lots of digestion, lots of modification of the chyme. So really lots going on there. And so I wanted to give us a lot of um, space to explore that. Um, we know the duodenum also receives secretions from the accessory organs. So the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, which is usually hidden by the stomach. Okay. Um, of course, uh, the duodenum leads into the rest of the small intestine. Okay. Um, and down here, what I have for you is um, kind of zooming in on the villi. We know that the villi are actually lining the entire small intestine, right? They are going to increase the surface area for secretion and absorption. Um, and so way down here, um, presumably more towards the ileum, we're going to zoom into the villus and actually um, explore how all of those digested molecules from farther up here are going to be absorbed, right? So they're going to go from in the lumen in this tube across the brush border or across these enterocytes, and they are going to enter into either the blood capillaries, right, which we can see here, red oxygenated blood, blue deoxygenated blood, um, and the lacteal in the middle, right? So um, that's where we're going with this. Again, the control mechanisms I'm going to try to draw out for you over here. The digestion and absorption stuff I'm going to try to draw out for you guys over here. Right? So what's actually happening with the molecules inside um, the lumen of the GI tract. Okay. Questions so far? All right. Um, so uh, we know that before we even take a bite of food, our digestive system is activated. Right? We know that if we had a cookie sitting there on the desk, we could smell the cookie, we could see the cookie, um, we could be thinking about eating the cookie, and all of a sudden our stomach starts to growl. Right? And so we know that that is an indication of the beginning of the digestive process. So um, that is actually phase number one the cephalic phase. All right, so phase number one, the cephalic phase. And we also know that this involves the, we'll say the smelling of the cookie or the sight of the cookie. All right, we know it's there. We really want it. All right, so this sensory information will be relayed to our brain and our brain is going to trigger the salivary glands to start secreting. Okay. So in the cephalic phase, we have um, cranial nerves trigger what type of salivary glands, specifically the extrinsic salivary glands. To start secreting into the oral cavity. All right, so now that we're talking about cookies, maybe your mouth is watering. And so that is actually the extrinsic salivary glands, the sublingual, the submandibular, the parotid salivary glands, dumping all sorts of stuff into the oral cavity. Okay, does that make sense so far? Hopefully this is uh, fairly basic at this point. Okay, um, let's continue with this tech. Um, as part of these secretions, we know that there's all sorts of different stuff in that saliva above and beyond what is normally kind of floating around in our mouth, kind of cleansing it and um, buffering the pH of our, um, of our oral cavity, et cetera. So these extrinsic salivary glands are going to release digestive enzymes. Specifically, they are going to release salivary amylase. All right, so um, I'm going to try to keep the enzymes here in red. All right, so salivary amylase and lingual lipase, right? Both of these enzymes tell us exactly what they do. 
Um, amylase digests amylose. Um, so we're going to try to simplify this here. It is going to digest carbohydrates. A okay, lingual lipase, again, it tells us exactly what it does. This lip right here tells us that it is going to digest lipids. Okay, so um, at this point, we really only need to think about um, the four biomolecule classes, not individual types of them. Okay. Um, the other thing that these names tell us is that they're both in the mouth. So lingual means tongue, salivary means it's in the saliva, it's in the oral cavity. So if I give you a list of enzymes on an exam, for example, um, you could just look at those names and you can automatically figure out that, yep, this one's in the saliva, as is this one. Okay. Um, so we'll come back to that in just a second. Well, actually, no, we'll, we'll finish this out. Um, so the cephalic phase not only includes when you are sitting there looking at the cookie and smelling the cookie, it also um, includes finally taking a bite of that cookie and chewing it up. Um, so if we take a bite of that cookie, um, essentially our chewing or mastication um, is going to mix the saliva with the cookie, making it into this glob of squishy cookie. Right? We call that the bolus. Um, and the bolus isn't just created to ease deglutition, right? to ease the swallowing process and make that a little bit easier, but also it begins the process of digestion. Okay? So the only way that we get chemical digestion is to have these enzymes breaking bonds in these biomolecules. Okay. Um, so what this means is that there are only two different types of enzymes in the oral cavity. And so we only begin the digestion of carbs and lipids in the oral cavity. Proteins, no. Nucleic acids, no. Only these two. Right? The other thing is that this is only digestion. Right? It's only taking big stuff and making it smaller. We don't actually take in this sugar or take in these fats until all the way down here in the small intestine. Okay, that's a really big um, source of confusion, um, at least in the past. Um, yeah, I, uh, definitely, I can write bigger. Um, uh, so uh, it has been a source of confusion in the past. Um, digestion versus absorption. So far, we are only talking about taking big stuff and making it smaller, right? So salivary amylase. Again, that breaks down the carbs. And lingual lipase, right? Only the carbs and the lipids, OK? Maybe I can get a little bit closer here as well. Okay, um, so digestion is beginning in the oral cavity. All right. The other thing that is happening within the cephalic phase is um, we are preparing the stomach for the entry of that bolus, of that cookie. Okay. Um, so uh, we also have the brain regulating what's happening in the stomach right, by sending messages down the vagus nerve. Right, so the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, is going to increase, okay, increase, so up arrow here, the stomach motility Um, so the actual churning of the stomach, remember that the stomach has three different layers of muscle tissue within that muscularis externa. Um, and so the neurotransmitters from the vagus nerve, that acetylcholine, is going to trigger contractions of the stomach muscles, and therefore it's going to start churning. And so that's why your stomach starts to growl the second you start thinking about the cookie or eating the cookie. Um, in addition to increasing motility or physical movement, physical churning, it's also going to stimulate more 
secretion. Okay, so um, this looks a little weird in this drawing, but essentially what I'm trying to get at here is that there are gastric glands embedded within the wall of the stomach. Okay, um, and those gastric glands can be triggered to squeeze out their contents into the lumen of the stomach. Okay. Um, what exactly is secreted by these gastric glands? Well, let's write it out. Okay. What types of secretion are happening? All right. First of all, um, within the gastric glands, we have, we'll start with parietal cells. The parietal cells are going to release lots of acid. Okay. Um, also, parietal cells are going to release intrinsic factor. Okay, so that's going to help us to absorb vitamin B12 farther on down um, in the intestines. We also have chief cells. Okay. Chief cells are, they're the chiefs, they're the ones that are uh, secreting like the most important stuff. And that most important stuff is pepsinogen. Okay, so pepsinogen is a zymogen. Right? It is a protein digesting enzyme that isn't exactly turned on just yet. Right? We don't want protein digesting enzymes to digest the muscles or the glands themselves. So we want to make sure that pepsinogen is not turned on until it gets into the stomach. So what we do is we use hydrochloric acid to change the shape of pepsinogen into the active form pepsin. Okay. Pepsin is responsible for digesting proteins. We also know that hydrochloric acid denatures those same proteins. Okay, so um, what we can see so far is that the stomach has a really prominent role in breaking down proteins in particular. Okay. All right. Um, the chief cells also release another hormone or sorry, not another hormone, um, another enzyme, and that is gastric lipase. All right, again, the LIP is indicating lipids, so we can see that there's going to be some fat digestion within the stomach as well. Um, we know where this enzyme is coming from as well because of the word gastric. Gastric is always going to indicate to us that this is from the stomach. That makes sense. Um, hopefully this is somewhat helpful so far. Um, if not, we can redirect to talk about what exactly you guys need. Okay. Um, so you're welcome to use the chat function. I can see that um, on the screen. Okay. Um, all right, the other thing that's going on here is that these gastric glands, again, which have been triggered to secrete by the vagus nerve in response to seeing, smelling, maybe even tasting that cookie is that the G cells are going to release um, a series of um, hormones. The one that we care about the most is gastrin. Okay, so I'm going to make the, uh, the hormones in green, right? We know that there are a lot of hormones. Okay, um, so Gastrin is secreted by these enzymes or by these uh, gastric glands 
but it is actually part of the control, um, the control mechanism. And okay, so what I'm going to draw for you is that um, these little gastrin molecules are released from the gastric glands, not into the lumen where the rest of this stuff has been secreted. Right, so all of the enzymes are here in the lumen, but the green gastrin is secreted into the blood. And what it's going to do is bind back onto the stomach <coughs> and further increase these things. Okay, so we also have in this uh, phase over here, in this cephalic phase, we also have gastrin is going to increase motility and secretion as well. Okay, um, so essentially this is a positive feedback loop, right? The more the vagus nerve triggers the stomach, the more gastrin is going to be released, the more gastrin is released, the more these muscles are going to contract, the more the gastric glands are going to secrete. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. Um, so that's the first phase. The next phase is going to begin as soon as your bolus, all right, so your cookie makes it all the way down into the stomach. Right. And again, the process of swallowing and the peristalsis that pushes that cookie all the way down your esophagus is called deglutition, the swallowing reflex. Okay. As soon as that food enters the stomach, we begin phase number two. Right. The gastric phase. Okay, so this is a phase where the activity of the stomach is going to be ramped up as much as possible. And so why does that happen or what actually stimulates that? Well, yes, of course, we still have some vagus nerve secretion or vagus nerve control, um, but the stomach itself is going to detect a change, right? So as the bolus enters, the bolus itself your chewed up cookie that's been mixed with all of, or all of these lovely things is going to increase the pH of the stomach, all right? The cookie is neutral. And so when it is dumped into this very acidic environment of the stomach, the pH of the stomach is going to rise. And that is going to be detected um, by various cells within the stomach and ultimately lead to the secretion of even more of this stuff. And so all of these things that we've already talked about are going to be even more enhanced during the gastric phase in response to the pH going up, oops, the protein content going up. Right? All those proteins from your cookie are also going to trigger the stomach to increase its activity. Why would proteins in particular be the correct stimulus? Well, the main, um, the main biomolecules that we're digesting in the stomach are proteins. And as a result, if there are more proteins, the stomach has to increase its activity so we can fix this protein problem, so we can get rid of these extra proteins. Okay, um, also, uh, stretch, right? Before the stomach was empty and even though it was churning, there wasn't actually a cookie in it just yet. And so now the cookie has entered and so the walls of the stomach are going to stretch out. And as a result, that stretch is detected and it directly leads back to, via a reflex, more secretion of all of this stuff from the gastric glands, okay? Any, any questions about that? Do you want me to say that again? anything at all. Okay. And good then. Um, so um, the stomach is going to do its thing. It is going to be digesting, right? Both mechanically, right? It is denaturing, unraveling those proteins. 
And then it is actually using the activated enzyme pepsin to break those peptide bonds in between amino acids. All right, also, to some extent, there is some digestion of lipids. Okay. Once again, I want to point out that until or up until now, we have started breaking down carbohydrates. We have started breaking down lipids, both in the mouth. In the stomach, we have continued digesting lipids because there are, there are enzymes within the stomach that digest lipids. We have begun the digestion of proteins, again, because of these digestive factors, but this amylase here, um, and also the lipase, are themselves proteins. And so when they get into the stomach, them or they as proteins are going to unravel and no longer be active in the stomach. So the only digestion that's occurring is from the actual stomach enzymes. Okay. Another note, we still haven't actually absorbed anything, right? Your oral cavity and glands are working super hard. Your stomach is working hard, but we don't actually have any payoff for all that investment just yet. We are just breaking bonds. We are making big stuff smaller. We haven't gotten here yet. We don't have anything in the blood just yet. Okay. So once the stomach has been churning and mixing and digesting for a little while, the pyloric sphincter is going to relax temporarily. Therefore, opening up and allowing a tiny bit of chyme, right? Three milliliter little squirt of chyme. That is all of this stuff mixed with your cookie. And that is going to enter into the duodenum. Okay. This is going to trigger the third and final stage of control or of digestion here. Okay. The third and final phase is the intestinal phase. Okay, and hopefully you're seeing that these words, these control phases are like obvious, right? They, they make a lot of sense, right? When stuff is happening in your head, it's the cephalic, right? Your head is the cephalic phase. When stuff is happening in your stomach, it's the gastric phase, the stomach phase. When chyme enters the intestines, it's the intestinal phase, right? So hopefully, this makes sense if you just step back and think about what the words mean and hopefully put it into a little bit of perspective here. Okay, so we have the intestinal phase. Once again, we have the changing of this environment within the lumen, right? Just like we saw in the stomach, the stomach itself was changed in these ways as soon as your cookie entered it. Now, when the chyme enters the intestines, it is going to, all right, first of all, it's going to um, decrease the pH of the intestines, okay? Um, quite substantially, right? The normal pH of the duodenum is like eight, the stomach is like two, and so when that pH of two chyme enters the duodenum, it is a drastic shift in that organ, okay? As a result, the duodenum itself is going to release something, right? A lot of things actually, to fix that problem, right? We want to change this pH. We really don't like such acidic stuff in our intestines. Um, if you've ever eaten like super acidic food or maybe even super spicy food, you know that sometimes you can feel it kind of going all the way through your intestines just because you've like overloaded this process. Um, that is not ideal at all. So a um, couple different things are going to happen. Um, first of all, the duodenal glands right, are only present in the duodenum and their sole purpose in life is to secrete buffers that ultimately increase that pH. Okay, so we're going to secrete some buffers from the wall of the duodenum into the lumen, right? And that's going to help a little bit. That's great and all, but we need a little bit more help. And so in response to low pH, 
the mucosa itself, right, the cells lining this lumen that I have drawn here in red are going to release a hormone, right? That hormone is secretin. Okay, so in response to a super low pH, secretin is released by the duodenal mucosa itself. Okay, and secretin is released into the blood. So not into the lumen, but into the blood. And it's going to talk to the pancreas. When the pancreas detects secretin, it is going to release bicarbonate-rich fluid, right? So essentially a buffer. It's going to help increase this pH, and it's going to release it into the duodenal lumen. Okay, so again, secretin is a hormone released by the small intestine itself. It binds to receptors on the pancreas. The pancreas is then going to respond to this hormone by releasing uh, buffers, right? Bicarbonate, right? Our primary buffer um, to increase the pH in the lumen. Right, we also know that the pancreas is going to release these contents um, via the main pancreatic duct and ultimately through the major duodenal papilla into the lumen. Okay, do I need to say any of that again? I know there are lots of big words in there. Okay. Um, so hormones secreted to fix this pH problem. The other, or another change that's happening in the intestines when your cookie finally makes it to the intestines is that um, there's going to be a lot more lipids, right? All that butter within that cookie makes it super tasty, but we have to break down the fat in that butter. Okay, so when the lipid content increases, again, the duodenum is going to respond by releasing a hormone called cholecystokinin or CCK. Okay, and hormone, hormone, hormone. Okay, CCK, just like secretin, is going to be released into the blood. Okay, so not into the lumen like all those other fluids, but into the blood it will bind to receptors on the liver and the gallbladder. In response, the liver and the gallbladder are going to release bile down the common bile duct and into the duodenal lumen via the same route as the pancreatic juices via this major duodenal papilla. Okay. Um, and so bile in particular um, is something that is going to help fix this problem right here, the lipid problem. And so I'm going to write it in on this side. Okay. So back to the actual digestive processes, right, all kind of happening at the same time. Um, and draw another dotted line here, indicating that this stuff is happening in the stomach. This is happening in the oral cavity. All of this stuff down here below the dotted line is going to be happening in the small intestine. Following so far, All right, lots of moving pieces, All right? But this is literally like three PowerPoints and a week and a half um, of lessons into one silly picture. Um, so, uh, we have, let's see, color do I want to use? Huh. I'm out of good colors here. Um, can we see this bile? Okay. Yeah. So bile, um, is going to be secreted into the duodenal lumen. Now, 
bile, we know, is an emulsifier. So what this is going to do is it's going to take big droplets of lipids and some big clumps from inside the lumen. And it is going to break them down into tiny little droplets. All of these droplets are going to be surrounded by little bile salts, right? And this essentially makes them more okay with being in the fluid of the intestines, right? So, right, bile is working inside the lumen. We take big droplets and we make them into smaller droplets. Okay. Of course, these smaller droplets are surrounded by the bile salts. Okay. This is called emulsification. So bile is going to emulsify the lipids. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. All right. Now, these lipids aren't gone, right? we still haven't physically digested them yet, right? We've just made the remaining lipids a little bit more manageable, a little bit easier to deal with. And so the other thing that we're going to need to actually fix this lipid problem is digestive enzymes, okay? Um, and so CCK is also going to talk to the pancreas. The pancreas in that pancreatic juice that has been stimulated by secretin are going to be a series of digestive enzymes, such as pancreatic lipase. Okay. Um, so we know that from the pancreas, right, as stimulated by actually both CCK and secretin together, now there's a slide about that in the PowerPoint, but both of these hormones together are going to trigger the release of enzymes from the pancreas, again, through the main pancreatic duct into the duodenal lumen via the major duodenal papilla. And now that chyme can be mixed with lots of digestive enzymes including pancreatic lipase. And so pancreatic lipase is going to break down the lipids inside these little droplets called micelles. Okay, um, so now we will have just the digested lipids. Okay, so fully digested, right? So remember that the purpose, the major function of the entire digestive system is to take large biomolecules, make them smaller, so make them into the monomers, because the only thing that can actually be absorbed across the mucosa, right, so across this barrier and actually into the blood are monomers. And so the combination of bile from the liver and lipase from the pancreas, that's the only way we are going to get um, to actually absorb lipids. Okay. Does that make sense? Should I say any of that again? Okay, um, and I am recording this so you can play it back um, again if you would like. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit more about all of these pancreatic things. Okay. Again, the combination of CCK and secretin is going to lead the pancreas to release enzymes into the duodenum. Now the duodenum has its own enzymes, but it cannot actually digest all four biomolecule classes. In fact, the only organ that creates enzymes to do so is the pancreas, right? We haven't even talked about nucleic acids yet. <laughs> so, um, the pancreas is also going to secrete, right, so from here into the duodenum, 
also going to secrete um, pancreatic amylases, right, and a series of other carbohydrates or carbohydrate digesting enzymes. It is going to secrete pancreatic nucleases. And finally, we can digest those nucleic acids. And finally, it is going to release something called um, Oh my gosh, what is it called? Uh, trypsinogen, sorry about that. Oh my gosh, trypsinogen. Okay, and so this word is telling us that this is a zymogen, zymogen. It is an inactive enzyme, okay? This is a protease. It is meant to digest proteins, but of course we don't want to digest the pancreas. We don't want to digest these ducts we only want to digest the proteins that are in your cookie from within the lumen of the small intestine. And so as soon as trypsinogen is released into the uh, duodenal lumen, there are the enzymes that are actually embedded within these brush border cells is going, are going to activate trypsinogen into the active form, trypsin. Okay, and so that is going to happen with the brush border enzymes. Okay, so um, the take home message here is that the only way to get this activated form of the protease is for trypsinogen to enter into the small intestine. That is the only way to activate trypsin. Okay. And as we know, trypsin is going to digest the proteins. Questions? All right. So to summarize all of these things, the main enzymes that are going to actually physically be digesting within the small intestine aren't actually made by the small intestine, right? They're not made by the stomach because all of those stomach enzymes are turned off when the pH changes, right? So we just brought that pH back up. So all of these things are inactivated, okay? The only way we get digestion of all the different types of molecules that we can digest is with an active pancreas. Right, so this is why um, pancreatic cancer um, uh, leads to fatality so quickly, right? If you don't have a functional pancreas to produce all these enzymes, you can't actually get nutrition into your blood, into your body. Um, and also the pancreas um, secretes insulin and glucagon and lots of other types of hormones. And so we really, really need this squishy little gland beneath our stomach. All right, a uh, couple other control mechanisms happening within this intestinal phase, All right? Um, let's see, we have GIP. Um, so in response to glucose, right? So the sugar that has been digested by salivary amylase and by the pancreatic carbohydrate digesting enzymes glucose itself is going to lead to the secretion of GIP, a right? glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide. Oh my gosh, that craziness. What is happening? GIP is secreted by the small intestine itself. Just like secretin, it's going to circulate in the blood and it's going to talk to the pancreas. Right, so it's going to bind to receptors on the target tissues, which happen to be on the pancreas. Okay. In response, the pancreas is going to secrete even more hormones. 
right? So, oh my gosh, endocrinology. Um, the pancreas is going to release insulin into the blood, All right? We know that insulin, when it binds to our tissue cells, is going to cause the uptake of glucose into those tissues or into those tissue cells. Um, and so let me just briefly draw this in on the liver over here. When insulin binds to the liver, we are going to add these extra like glucose channels and glucose is going to be taken into those hepatocytes. And I know that's a little bit small, but what I'm getting at here is that insulin from the pancreas tells the liver to take glucose that we just digested in the intestines into the liver cells. And the liver can then store glucose as glycogen, right? Remember after a meal, we have lots and lots of glucose circulating in our blood. And so we want to take that glucose out. We don't want the blood sugar spike. Instead, we want to store it so that um, when we don't eat lunch or dinner for another several hours, we can take that glucose back out of storage and dump it into the blood. Okay. Does that make sense? Or you guys will tell me if it doesn't make sense, hopefully. Okay, um, let's see. Oh. Uh, one final thing, um, as part of this intestinal phase, we have, um, right, when proteins are detected in the duodenum, the duodenal cells are going to release vasointestinal peptide. Um, and what that's going to do, right, when VIP is released, VIP actually binds to these smooth muscle cells of the tunica media and actually leads to more blood flow into these capillary beds. And therefore more blood flow allows more absorption of all of these things that we just digested. Okay. Um, another note about the control before we get into the absorption and that's the last piece of the puzzle that I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, all of these hormones collectively are going to decrease stomach activity. Um, and activity is um, summative for both motility, the churning, as well as the secretion of all of this stuff. And so the idea here is that um, if we are secreting hormones with all our might, if we are secreting enzymes with all our might and trying to digest, trying to break down and get through all of that food, we really don't want the stomach to keep shooting more and more and more cookie into the intestines. So while all of this is happening, we kind of put the brakes on the stomach. Once that cookie gets far enough along, all of these stimuli are no longer going to be as strong. And so there's less of this stuff secreted. And so the brakes are removed from the stomach. And so now the stomach can churn, digest, and push more chyme into the intestines. Once that happens, all of these stimuli return. All of this stuff happens again, and the brakes are put on the stomach. And so um, just like I've said before, um, the gastric and intestinal phases kind of go back and forth, put on the brakes, Put, up, put on the brakes and then take them off, on and off, depending on what's happening in the intestines. Okay, questions? Okie dokie. Um, so, control mechanisms. Digestion. We have just taken big clunky polymers and broken them down into absorbable monomers. So I'm going to draw one more dotted line. Okay. 
this is absorption, ABS absorption across the brush border, across these enterocytes into the circulation, which as we know is ultimately going to go to the liver for processing. Okay, um, so let's um, see, let's first talk about carbohydrates and carbs, proteins, and nucleic acids. They all kind of work the same way. They're all hydrophilic and therefore they can be easily transported within the blood. Okay, so um, if we have carbs, all right, so here, this is a carbohydrate or protein, or actually, be more specific about this. Um, this is a glucose or an amino acid or a nucleotide. All right, so all of these are monomers. All of them can actually go across this brush border. Okay. Um, in order to begin this process, we first have to generate a concentration gradient. So the first thing these are the nuclei and I'm just gonna get the nucleus out of the way. The first thing we do is use a sodium potassium pump to pump sodium into the blood. Okay, so this is the blood side, this is the lumen side, here's where the sugar and all these things are. We want it to get across this membrane. Okay, so on the blood side, we pump sodium out of the cell into the blood. That leaves a low sodium concentration inside the cell. Okay? We can use that low sodium concentration and we can use it with specialized channel proteins right? in order for sodium to flow down its concentration gradient. Right? So from the lumen where we just had lots of salt with or you know, a little bit of salt within our cookie, um, sodium, of course, wants to go inside the cell down its concentration gradient. But the only way to do that is to bring a friend. Okay. So sodium flows down its concentration gradient passively and brings with it one of these molecules that we just digested farther up in the system. We can then allow our glucose or amino acid or whatever to flow down its concentration gradient from high inside the cell to low inside the blood in order to fully absorb it into the body. Okay. Um, if you remember, this process is called secondary active transport. Um, and it takes energy over here, but over on this side, on the lumen side, it is passive. So those ones are the relatively easier ones. <laughs> um, secondary active transport, period. Now let's talk about those pesky lipids. Where we left off up here, the lipids themselves were digested and they were surrounded by bile salts. Okay, collectively, this little droplet is called a micelle. Okay. Um, essentially, the lipids are covered by something that looks kind of sort of like um, phospholipids, right? So on the very outside, it's easy to interact with water. On the inside, it is hydrophobic, and so the lipids are happy. Um, and so the micelles enclosing these little blue lipids are super similar in structure to our plasma membranes. And so the micelles, lucky for them, can just slip over the membrane of the cell, right? They don't need any fancy proteins or transport mechanisms. They're pretty much the same thing as the, our cell membranes. And so they can just slip inside. Now, my cells can't really be transported um, in the lymphatic system or anywhere else. And so we actually have to repackage them. And we repackage them in the Golgi apparatus. Okay. So within the Golgi, the micelles are repackaged into something, um, 
I'm running out of space for the words, called chylo microns. Okay. So chylo microns. Um, so these little vesicles are really easy to transport in the lacteals. Okay. And so instead of going into the blood, right, like all of these other molecules did, okay, so that's the blood, it's going up through the hepatic portal vein, the chylomicrons are going to enter into the lacteals. Now, if we look inside this villus, right, what we have just done is we have taken a chylomicron from out here or in the lumen here and crossed over the brush border into the lacteal. Remember that lymphatic structures are really porous. They have these huge like flappy gaps um, between the cells of these vessels. And so they can just suck up these, um, you know, kind of clunky lipid droplets and milk them back out of the intestines. And for a little perspective here, all the way up to the liver. And the liver is going to process them and repackage the chylomicrons into LDL and HDL, right? So those low density and high density lipoproteins, good and bad cholesterol, all that happens up here. But the only way it does is for, let's rewind a little bit, bile to emulsify the lipids, lipase to break them down. My cells are formed with these digested lipids. My cells cross over the enterocytes, the mucosal barrier. They are repackaged in the Golgi apparatus. They then pass through the membrane on the blood or lacteal side. Then they are taken into the lacteals, a lymphatic structure, and milked all the way back up to the liver for repackaging. And this repackaging is so important because all the cells of our body need cholesterol, they need fats, but um, chylomicrons, micelles, any of those things cannot be circulated within the blood. So we need to repackage them in the liver and the liver dumps them into the blood, which then goes back to the heart. And that is the short version of the digestive system. Um, any questions you guys have for me?